kind of good. Gotta fire off this tweet here, let everybody know. Oh my god, I'm late! I am so sorry! Hopefully my audio is being caught. Let me actually kind of listen to myself real quickly. My audio is being caught. Okay! Audio is good! We, we heard that! We heard it live! Okay, so, uh, we'll just give it a little bit of time, get some people to trickle in here. But, uh, yeah! It's been a bit of an interesting week. And, uh, I do again apologize for being late. Uh... I, honestly, I can keep coming up with, like coming up with excuses. It's not really excuses. It's actually things that happen. Um, primarily, I was just helping the wife out. She forgot something, and uh, traveling back and forth was uh, a pain. It's like a thirty-minute trip back or one direction. So I'm mean, gonna go back and forth like twice. You see, I'm mean, kind of ate up time. I'm like, oh, I got everything ready for this. You know, I got I got the um, I got my script ready and all that jazz. Like, I got everything I wanted to say. Like, just like my notes. I say it's script. It's just most of my, my notes of what I want to kind of like just touch on and talk about. And, um, yeah, just what I want to talk about, what we're going to be reviewing today. And today is going to be kind of awesome because I'm glad um, we're going to finally talk about Gundam Thunderbolt. And we're going to talk about Gundam 0083. I'm actually going to throw in some bonus here for Gundam 0083. And we're going to be reviewing the compilation movie alongside with the two shorts, uh, Mayfly, the Mayfly of Space. Bear with me for a moment. I'm just trying to get everything settled up here. I literally just managed to get... Ooh, I can... That's so cool. There's a dashboard on the mobile. That's interesting. Uh, but... I don't know. Did that cause an issue? Let me just click into this. It's kind of cool. I've got to mess with these kind of things, you know. Long press on my avatar. Oh, I actually can see all this stuff here. That's really cool. Maybe I, I can utilize this more. We'll, we'll see if I can do a little bit of a hybrid, you know. Oh. Okay, let me refresh this page here. I'm just going to be waiting for trickle in. I see a couple already. Hey, everybody. All right. I'm just making sure everything's good. Let's just do a quick little check here. And boop, boop. Boop, boop. All right. It works. Hey! I want to get my uh, little... I wonder what happened to my script. I could swear I had it up here, and now it's not there anymore, and I gotta pull it up. <laughs> I need to really remember to do this, and just make sure I write this shorter, you know, rather than something uh, lengthy. We're gonna break this up into two little sections here, Ooh, and kind of. Oh, you wouldn't be able to see that. <laughs> uh, do, 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 do. And there's the Twitch portion right... Come on. Get going. Arr. All right, there we go. All right, I'm going to give it another, like, minute or so. Whoa. I dropped my flashlight. Ugh. Which was right behind my drink when I was trying to grab one for a quick little sip. Whoop. Oof. That is sweet stuff. <laughs> I don't know if this is reconnecting to the chat, but um it says reconnecting to the chat. Oh, cool. Now I'm in my chat room. Yay. <laughs> I set that right there. Okay. Give it another 15 seconds, and then we shall begin the review. Do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do-do. 
I'm being a dork. Yes. <laughs> All right. <coughs> Sorry about that, guys. I mean, I can't control that. Really. I have an ability to really mute myself. Maybe I. Maybe I could. I could. I could have done this and unmuted. See. Anyways, welcome to another Nerdy Reviews live stream. Um, if you're not familiar with Nerdy Reviews live stream, this is where I do a live stream show where I review a lot of things. In this case right now, we're doing a set of anime series and we're going to be covering the Gundam franchise and in its entirety, as much as I can at least. All right, what I can get my little dirty grubby paws on or what I have in my collection currently. Um, so where we last left off so far, we're pretty much at the tail end of the One Year War series. We covered quite a bit here. And now we're going to be jumping into a little bit of the After War stuff. Now we kind of got a little bit of the After War, not so much so with Gundam 0080. Truly it was mostly a, a One Year War series and not After the War. But now we're going to start diving into some other little specialty ones. So today, like I mentioned earlier too, we're going to be covering Gundam Thunderbolt. And it's, we're going to be covering the two compilation movies of Gundam Thunderbolt, which the first one covers the end, end of the One Year War, and the other one covers a little bit afterwards. And then after I review that, we will then be covering Gundam 0083. And with Gundam 0083, of course, as the year indicates, we are going to be after the One Year War. We're going to be finally moving outside of the One Year War series and just progressing through the Universal Century at that point. So, um, at this point, I believe I have reviewed everything with, with Thunderbolt completed. Everything of the One Year War that is currently released in Japan and in the North America, or North America and all other continents as well. Uh, all One Year War content will now be covered um, as of right now. So, that's going to be kind of cool. We're going to now start going to be slowly diving into um, other series... Well, not serious, but like moving forward into the universal century, moving forward in the timeline, rather being stuck in the one year war for some people who are going to be, oh my God, it's so grateful that we're going to be glad we're going to be out of the one year war stuff. And then there's going to be some people like myself, which is like, I would like to have more side stories. I would like to have more one year war stuff. Haha, I caught myself this time. See, so I don't have to blow your ears out. Isn't that so considerate of me? <laughs> But we're going to finally be getting out of the One Year War stuff. We're going to be moving in the timeline. The sad thing is that a lot of the stuff in the newer timelines or higher timelines, there's not that many um, devotion to them. So they're going to be kind of like one series based on this particular war or event or crisis, basically. And moving on from there. So we're going to start moving more streamlined. There's going to be, out of all the series so far, the One Year War has the most... Movies, o OVAs, and uh, series themselves to cover. So it's a lot of ground to cover in the One Year War. A lot of material, which is some of most of it's great. Some of it's not. We kind of covered that already. If you haven't already, check back my previous reviews. Um, other than that, yeah, we're gonna be going into uh, very shortly to end of the one year war and something weird a little bit afterwards and 0083 we're going to deal with the stardust or operation stardust and then shortly we're going to be jo uh, jumping along uh, right into uh, feature stuff such as the grips war or grips conflict defending how you want to call it and the first neo zeon war that said let's go ahead and begin our nerdy review on Gundam Thunderbolt, or Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt. Now, for those of you who don't know, Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt is a ONA, or ONA, which is a original net animation. I actually did not know that terminology, actually, until I had to look it up, uh, specifically for this particular series. I always had thought, because when I, my familiarity with Thunderbolt was that it was a manga turned into a movie. I didn't realize it was a manga turn into a net series and then turn into these two movies which are compilations of the net series um good news i i, I mean depending on how you want to look at it um the compilation of these movies actually cover majority of what's in the series themselves so we're not really missing out a whole lot they're two hour movies each let me see let me double check i'm pretty sure they were two hours each 
No, 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 I'm sorry. This is an hour 30... Yeah, hour 30... No, hour 20 or so, and this is an hour 30. So, um... I'm doing my math wrong here. Sorry. Hour 10, hour 20. I am... I'm off with my timing here. So it, it covers quite a bit. Um, well, not cover, but covers majority of the Ona series itself. So it's going to be seeing a whole lot when I get to the review itself. But I want to give you that kind of context of what we're, we're going to be going into when it comes to uh, Gundam Thunderbolt. Now, it's broken up into those two movies, like I mentioned. The first one you can see on the screen here, too, is December Sky. I don't have a screenshot of it. But then there's also the second movie, which is Gundam, um, it's a, sorry, Thunderbolt, uh, Bandit Flower. Uh, now both of these series take place, okay, so how do I put this? So just to give you an idea of the synopsis of the story, so with December Sky, December Sky, takes place at the very tail end of the war here. Uh, we focus mostly on, you know, Federation Xeon forces fighting at side four. Particularly, we're following the ace pilots of EO Fleming, who is this gentleman, this spiky gentleman right here. And then we follow on Zeon side, Daryl Lorenz, who is this uh, Afro fellow over here. And as they clash it out and duke it out and duel it out, quite literally, in the uh, end of the one year war. So that's pretty much the first movie itself. The second movie, which unfortunately I do not have a cover for right now, but I'll show you the little cover right here, uh, takes place literally right after or right at the end of um, of the first series. Let me just enlarge that for you. There we go. I should have got, got it on the screen cap, but that's okay. Uh, but uh, takes place right at the end of December Sky, where it leaves off because it has a little cliffhanger, right? Uh, takes place right after that, and then it time skips eight months after the One Year War, where we basically follow mostly um, EO and the Federation, alongside with Daryl and the Xeon uh, Remnants. Not Xeon specifically, but Xeon Remnants. In the search for the Psychozaku's data, which happens to be in the hands of a cult by the name of the South Seas Alliance. And it gets a little bit funky right there. Um, so, that being said, on, on the story itself, the... It doesn't seem like there's a whole lot going on because there isn't really a whole lot going on. Um, I, I don't, I don't want to jump right into that port, but I want to jump into some of like the cooler aspects that I really digged about the movies themselves. And first and foremost, I want to talk about is the animation. If you even just look like right over here, that is the primary animation you're really looking at. Some of the, these are actually looking pretty good within the series, uh, the movie itself, just not as f uh, fluid or flux like it is. So the big the big thing between this is that the animation style is very very like stark and like heavy on the inking. A lot of this anim like this uh characterization reminds me a lot of things I've seen like in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure for an example. A lot of these like heavy inking, a lot of these like very masculine type of features and really, really drawn out, stark and contrasty, um, darker colors kind of thing. A lot different than what you would normally see in other Gundam series where it's a lot lighter in tone for color-wise and animation. So it's a, it's a really welcoming thing. Um, the mechs, the mechs are kind of like a little, it feels like a little bit of CGI, but not truly not. It's a big dip difference between like Origin and then this one right here. So it feels more like a fluid animation and it just, it's a wonder to watch. <laughs> it's a... Uh, I don't want to describe it. It's not like Speed Racer, like, eye melty sometimes, but it can get to those levels. <laughs> um, the other thing I really, really liked about this series, too, is the dubbing. Dubbing on this one, usually, like, you know, I've always talked about a lot of the early 90s to 2000s Gundam dubbing is, like, the, the prime one right there. The dubbing in this in this movie set is actually not that bad. I really really like it. Um, particularly, I'm like I, I spotted out uh, Daryl's voice the moment I heard it. It was Johnny Young Bosch. I I don't know if a lot of people know of, uh, know of this voice actor or care for him, but I love him as Vash the Stampede from Trigun. So I'm like as soon as I heard his voice, I'm like oh, that's Johnny right there. I recognize him. Like okay, and then everybody else like Eo's voice, uh, to Carla's. And Claudia, I mean, everyone sounds great. They are they fit within their role. It's just, everything gelled so well with the voice acting. The whole cast overall gels so well 
with the movies. So great job. I, I can't complain about that there. Um, I have not watched this in Japanese. I reviewed, I watched them. This is my second time watching both of them. And both times I've only watched it in English. Yeah, I'm like, well, Ozaki, you could watch it in Japanese. Like, mm, I don't like reading as much. I'm sorry, but um, I, I would probably say that, you know, I, I never doubt that the Japanese voice acting would ever sound that bad. You, a lot of them, a lot of times Japanese voice acting sounds great, has a lot of emotion, but um, if I'm going to have to pick between English or Japanese, I'm always going to pick English unless it's really, really bad. Like 1980s Guyver bad. Not the movie. I'm not talking about the movie. I'm talking about the actual manga, uh, manga, uh, manga company uh, dubbing of Guyver. Really, really bad. Um, so that's that's some things I want to talk about. Just kind of like both of the movies overall. Now I just want to talk about each of the movies in particular because they're quickest thing I could say about them is that it is a night and day difference between the two. So let me break it down. December Sky, man, that is a fun, action-packed, non-stop thrill ride for the most part. It is a flurry of music and destruction. That, that's the best way I can sum up that movie in, like, quick words. Um, I've already given you the story on December Sky, but basically, like, there's not a whole lot of plot going on in this story. Mostly just Federation versus Zeon at the end of the war, and then we're just following our two main protagonist antagonist in the story i think they share equal amount of screen time i think that it's a little bit more heavy on io's side or eo side is like io is his name so it's like eo io i think it's eo if i'm not correct if i'm not if i'm saying it correctly and it's it feels more like his movie and i say it this way because this movie is mostly dominated by the music and the action um, introduces a lot of like this bebop type jazz. I don't know. I don't, I'm not a music person. So forgive me if I'm this saying this, but it's more so like, um, like music you would hear from cowboy bebop, but turn like crank it to 11 and it's intense. It's crazy. It's actiony kind of jazzy music. And most of that it's, it's a character, not character said, but a characterization. So most of this like bebop actiony jazz comes from EO. Or I, uh, EO for the most part. Not most part, but it is his music. Whenever we get these scenes with like Daryl or focusing on Daryl for the most part, his m music mostly focuses more like kind of like that smooth jazz slash soft or somber arm B. <clears throat> Sorry about that. But it focuses mostly like on that stuff right there. So you get very contrasty music. And then when they get into their little duels or fights, it really becomes that clash of music. It's like a clash of the bands kind of a thing. So it's a very different feel. But much of this movie is really dominated by the music. It's what kind of I feel is what's the pushing force. It's not so much the story that's pushing the movie. It's the music. And the music is very uh, tonal. Very, very tonal. Very, very thematic. Or thematic at points too. A lot of EO's music is hot and fiery and even at points just angry. Um, and you can kind of get that a little bit in the story, not by a whole lot, like how EO's upset about uh, his father and what's going on with Claudia and those sort of things. And then when you get to Daryl's stuff, it's very much that somber, like soft, uh, soft R&B type music or, you know, smooth kind of jazzy music. And you get more of that, you know, that tone with him because he's just that calm, collect, um, remorseful almost about, you know, what's going on with him. He is a, um, I would say paraplegic and then he becomes quad paraplegic. If I'm, if I'm using my terminologies here correctly, medically, um, not too, uh, kind of a spoiler, I guess, but, um, in the movie itself. So it's like, you kind of get the somberness with him um, and his relation with Carla to um, his wanting or longing to be normal again or trying to fit or find purpose, repurposing himself to. So I think it's like a lot of the music kind of like controls a lot of this plot narrative. We're not getting a whole lot by the actual story itself, oddly. And I feel like the, the narrative is the narrative is really more controlled by the music. And this is a very unique thing for a Gundam series. I've never seen anything like in Gundam where 
the music is really the controller of the story, not the characters or the story slash plot line itself, but the music. So a lot of it is driven by, the, again, that fiery, hot jazz and soft, somber R&B. And that's what we get a lot from this series, or this particular movie itself. Um, like I was talking about, too, there's it It doesn't seem like it visually. You can get more of a sense of it in an audible sense, but the plot line is very, very paper thin. Character development, yes, we do see some semblance of it, but honestly, it's more, it's kind of like, passerby kind of situations it is a compilation film so i don't know how much between the ona series was taken into the movie itself from what i read about though after watching the movie the second time around and trying to get like an idea to try to do a comparison right from what i understand majority of the ona series was transported into this movie so it was compacted there's only eight episodes of the ona four episodes were compiled into this one hour and ten minute movie so it seems about right if every episode's about 20 minutes or so, give or take, not including opening and ending credits, right? Sounds about right. Maybe like 10 minutes was shaved off at best. Two, four, 60, one hour, and then an hour 20, so 10 minutes has to be shaved off. I actually don't know how long the series is on on the uh, when it was originally released, so I don't know. But if everything's condensed down, not really condensed down, so far from what I can understand, even if it's 10 minutes of scenes cut out, there's not a whole lot of character development. And that's another issue, too, is that when we're trying to get an idea about the plot, right, a lot of it doesn't, like, a lot of things don't make sense at certain points. Like, we can kind of get a little more of an understanding between, like, uh, Daryl and Carla's relationship and then, you know, how uh, Eo and Car uh, Claudia's relationship is, too. Um, but it's not really well-defined. We kind of got, like, ideas. There's a lot of exposition at times, but... We don't really get much of a strong semblance or an idea of that. Additionally, there's other things that don't make sense. And here's another spoiler, so I'm going to give you like that like little three, two, one, zero. Spoiler warning here, guys! Watch out! Um, so, it makes no sense in the movie why there's another character by the name of Grant. If I remember right, he was a, uh, a CO? I can't remember what he was. Not, not a captain, though. For whatever the reason, he shoots Carla. And to me, it didn't make any sense. I'm like, I understand he had resentment towards her, but there wasn't enough of this resentment to really establish why he would even go as far as to shoot her. Um, a lot of the things that like transpired through the events didn't quite make a lot of sense or how it was put together. Again, it's super paper thin with this plot, with the character development. Most of this movie is driven by the, by the action and then over heavy handed driven by the by the music of this entire movie I would say like it's it's so much so like you can literally feel like the sorrow and hatred and anger in Eo's again fiery jazz music and then that somber calm sadness within Daryl's music it's it's like night and day with them, these two, and then when they clash, their music just like evolves and kind of consumes the scenes alongside with the action. It's just that blurry mess, which is awesome. Love the action. Action's top notch. It's like almost nonstop at, at points. Gets a little crazy and out there. Really do enjoy and dig it. Which brings me to my next point here, and um, I'm just going to just kind of like put it up right here for you guys, just so you can, you know, kind of see it a little bit here for uh, Bandit Flower. So, now we're, uh, December Sky was very action-y, controlled by the music, very paper-thin plot line. Bandit Flower is the opposite. But I'm going to say opposite for all the wrong reasons, though. Sometimes, like, opposite's a good thing, right? Like, in this case here, like, I, I prefer to have a series that's more... A little slower pace at times. I, I do enjoy my action movies and stuff like that, but I want something a little bit slower pace, especially when it comes to Gundam. I want slower pace, I want characters, I want story. Bandit Flower tries to do this, but absolutely fails. It's a much slower pace. I would almost say, like, it's... You could almost say that these two movies... This is Eo's movie, and this is Daryl's movie. If you want to consider, like, like music-wise, right? 
But, um, how do I put this? Like, it's a very slow paced movie. Oh, hold on a second here. Sorry about that. I had a cough again. Had to fish out an oyster. Oh, that sounds so gross. <laughs> it's the truth. Um, anyways, I'm trying to give you guys a nice little view here. The sad thing about Bandit Flower here is that it's a much a slower paced film. A lot of the music is not as jazzy or crazy. It feels more so with that um, somber, calm music that Daryl has in the first movie. And that mostly orients this entire film. Um, and it tries to focus more on the characters and on a plot, but again, just like the first movie, it's very paper thin with the plot, paper thin with the characters. It tries to make certain explanations for certain characters, but it doesn't go full way. So it's kind of like, like a half explanation of them. And it feels very much so like a very lazy, like half half attempt on trying to create a solid story out of it. Honestly, you couldn't figure out what was really going on with the plot. I mean, you, get, you kind of get the idea of what they were doing, but it doesn't feel like it was a strong enough plot. It felt, felt like almost a MacGuffin, almost. Um, where both sides, the Federation and Xeon, are looking for the uh, data from the Psycho Zaku. And that's pretty much it. That, 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 that was the driving force. It didn't feel like it, though, because they didn't really make it seem like a big deal up until like the last 30 minutes of the movie. And that's where it was the biggest deal of them all. I'm like, Oh, okay. I thought that the, this was like a starter point And then we're going to go off to something else. It was like kind of the beginning MacGuffin and then we're going to get to something else. But no, it was the MacGuffin throughout the entire film. And that was it. Uh, we are introduced a couple of new characters here and they're okay. I mean, we, we, we get like a jazz, a little jazz band session with uh, Eo, and I, f I forgot her new, her the new character's name already. Uh, actually, let me see if I can see it from back here. Nope, they don't. Even, they barely even mention Eo and Daryl. It's mostly talking about Daryl, so it's like, oh yeah, it's putting putting it out. It's Daryl's story, really. Um, and then, yeah, that that that's just pretty much it with this movie here. It. It was a slower paced, calmer, tries to tell a story, but it, it goes in so many different directions, so many different ways with a paper thin plot that it already had. It was just poking holes at itself. Like we kind of jump back uh, with Carla for a little bit and it's not really, I mean, what's the point when it really didn't dive into anything else? We dive into some more things about Eo, which is great. But then Daryl gets completely left out with, with whatever character uh, po uh, points that he has as himself. And I, I just could not get behind Bandit Flower. There is some action in there. There are some cool mechs. Some, not by a whole lot, in here too. But honestly, it just felt like it, felt f it fell flat. The biggest crime that both of these movies commit is something I've talked about in the past. They do a cliffhanger at the ending. So at the ending of Thunderbolt or December Sky, I'm sorry. At the end of December Sky, they kind of did a, th they did a cliffhanger. I'm like, okay, that's fine. Cause I know there's a sequel, right? Sequel takes place. And it's like one of those cliffhangers where it's like, it's a huge buildup, right? I'm like, oh my gosh, what's going to happen? Starts off the movie with the cliffhanger. And then like, they didn't really do anything special. And then they time skip. Then what's the point of a cliffhanger that you leave off so amazing, so awesome, right? Ask so many questions and you kind of kind of wonder what's going to happen. Don't even bother with it. Okay. Well, then we get the Bennett Flower. I'm like, okay, cool. I'm trying to get into this. It's really, really hard. Don't care too much for the characters at the moment here. Or what's going on with the development doesn't make a lot, like not a whole lot of sense because of the pacing of the movie and how it's going. And then we get to the ending and it becomes another cliffhanger. The sad thing about this, though, is that this is capsizing the last f episodes four to eight, and the Ona has not picked up another set of series because the manga apparently has, like, another two more volumes or so, which could be easily another two more series, like, two more sets of Ona episodes, or, like, four or eight more episodes, or two more movies. But right now, there's no plans to make a sequel to this so far. So all we get is these two movies 
which were super fun, action packed, boring, and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Both of them have light, paper thin plot lines. It was just okay for the most part, you know? And now it leaves off on a cliffhanger that we're never going to see a sequel to. I hate those kind of things. I want to have some kind of conclusion. So I'm just going to have to end, like, you know, just make up what happened at the end of Bandit, uh, Bandit Flower, you know? Just, or what happens next, I guess. So that's not a whole lot of good right there. It just, eh, it irks me. It pisses me off. I don't know. I don't know how else to put it in the most blunt way possible. Um, that being said, though, I do want to jump into this next little fun part. Um, you guys are kind of familiar with me talking about is talking about the suits. Um, like I mentioned before, and you know, um, when it comes to every Gundam series, there is always a new set of suits introduced, new mech designs or redesigns of something previously. So, you know, Gundam Thunderbolt is nothing special. It was a manga brought into a series, brought into a movie. Um, and I thought it had some, some neat designs. Uh, one thing I do want to mention, though, that kind of ticked me off about it, too, is that it's kind of like the same thing what Unicorn does and um, what Origin does, too. I don't mind when we go back in time and we tell a story about the One Year War. I hate when we keep on trying to update it and try to introduce all this new tech so by the time you watch the original like if you watch the original Gundam and you watch something like December Sky for an example you're gonna go like why is December Sky like so advanced it's kind of like Star Wars watching episode four and then you go watch episode one you see all this advanced technology I'm like what just happened here did did they just get upgraded in the past and they downgraded in the future what's going on here so I, I thought that was kind of frustrating but it's, it's not that it's a bad thing though there were some kind of cool things, like seeing the GMs having these extra arms with the shields and stuff like that. I mean, it's cool. Cool thing. I, I think it was neat and all. I just didn't think it was appropriate during the one-year war because, like, we didn't really see this stuff. And that many GMs that are fitted like this? As far as I remember when it comes to the one-year war, the Federation was finally pumping out GMs like crazy, but they were just making regular stock GMs, you know? Just so they can shove pilots in there and their little iron cassets, uh, casket, uh, cassets and send them off to their doom just so they can fight for a cause like maintain power. That was it. It kind of baffles me when I see like newer tech and stuff like that in in these newer movies slash series. It kind of throws me off. But it's not that I don't appreciate the designs. I still think they're kind of cool though. Uh, but the biggest one I really, really liked though was finally incorporating because this Gundam has been more of a mobile suit variation or like um a suit that's been only seen like in comic books like or like you know like in um magazines like as a design but not really so much as an actual story so it's i think it's great to finally see the full armor rx-78 gundam or i said rx but full armor 78 uh gundam in display here and actually it's redone too uh i don't think i can find the original one let me try and see if i can pull you guys up the original one ah here we go this is the original full armor Gundam this has never really been seen it's more of a mobile suit variation like I said which is um, basically a collection of artwork slash designs from the designers of the series like the mech designers of the series and they create, you know, like what they think is going to be like, you know, the next suit. So we have the original one, which kind of looks kind of lame and um, OK one from the original Gundam, right? And then this is what Thunderbolt does to it. And it just it just gives it steroids and go and like go out and have fun. I think like we still keep a lot of the similar features that we see from the original, such as the shield with the double barrel um, uh, uh, mega particle cannons. Or that's what they are. Let me double check what they are again. I do apologize. This is a twin beam rifle. Okay. So a twin beam rifle, and this one should be still a twin beam rifle as well. Just want to be, you know, corrected here. Yeah, twin beam rifle right here. Additional armor. Yeah, so we got the twin beam rifle still here. It's still heavily armored, just like it is in the original one right here. It's just reinforced armor on it. 
But then we also get a lot of things that are in the Thunderbolt series. So like, you know, these extender, like extending arms that hold onto the shields. You got some additional weaponry for this Gundam and propellants too. It's kind of cool. Like in the movie, so you do see it drop down from what it does have. So like you can see at its most bare bones, like it looks like an okay design. I think it looks really, really ugly without the extra armor. It looks like, like a weird, weird blocky version of the original Gundam. But it still works out, though. I mean, like, I, I really do appreciate this redesign of the full armor Gundam. I also have to give a shout out to the um, the MSO six R Zaku two, which is the Psycho Zaku. I thought this was kind of weird because, like, when I looked at the name, I'm like, it's kind of R, so it's the same thing as the R series, right? And technically, it is. But the one I was misthinking of, and it, it even mentions right here, is the R dash one, which was this one right here. This is the one I was thinking that it was basically a. This is another MSV suit. Um, I'm mostly more familiar with it because of the games. But I thought that that's what this suit was, just redesigned, right? Because when I heard that it was has an arm, I'm like, oh, it's the redesigned version of it. Nope. It's actually uh, re-redesigned. It's, it's within the series itself, a redesigned suit, a redesigned version of the R1 um, to be a, a better high mobility type, incorporating all the positives and taking out all the negatives. Just like another suit I'll be talking about eventually. Not in this review, though. <laughs> But I really do love the design of the Psycho Zaku. It gets a little bit kind of crazier with like some of the at additional attachments to it and stuff like that. Uh, let me see if we can see it again here. You can kind of see it, not by a whole lot. You can see like the double uh, bazookas, but it had this huge thing. You can barely even see it in this uh, shadowing right here. But uh, it's a it's a great design. I, I really love and enjoy the, um, the MS6R Psycho Zaku design alongside with the full armor. So those are some of the designs I liked in this series. And um, next thing I want to get to is just the the fran the uh, main main kill. Uh, oh, sorry, I had to put this. So the next thing I want to talk about is just the main portion of uh, what people would probably like, try to get into. I'm sorry, Blah. I cannot talk. Sorry. Ooh, uh, I got some of this. Um, Strawberry lemonade from Wendy's. I had Wendy's earlier today. And this is super sweet. It's like the strawberry lemonade. Woof. For how sweet it is. Sometimes it's, it's like, oh, it's worse than that. I should get some water because lemonade is not good for you when you're thirsty. <laughs> it makes you more thirsty. Not true. I don't, I don't know how true. I have been hearing about that, though. Anyways. <laughs> Point being, though. Next thing I want to talk about is the... Um, if I am new to Gundam, is this a, is this something I should watch first? I'm gonna say this in the light the politest way possible. No, do not watch Gundam Thunderbolt, either December Skies and especially not um, Bandit Flower as your first Gundam series. Yes, December Sky is a fun, fast-paced, actiony, like music-driven Gundam movie, right? But it doesn't fit well into the overall, like, look into the Gundam franchise itself. Especially with Bandit Flower, where it tries to do what the, like, other Gundam series does, but falls completely flat on its face because of its paper-thin plot and character development. Um, it, it just kills your entry into it. So if you watch this, and you're like, oh man, this is what I'm going to expect from Gundam, and then you jump into another series like Zeta Gundam, or even the original Gundam, and you go like, this is not what I signed up for. Um, I would easily tell you, like, if you want something action-packed, like, this is a really action-packed, uh, movie for the first one with December Sky, so I would recommend that if, like, you really, really want action-based stuff, I think you're gonna appreciate, uh, December Sky more than anything else, but leave it alone after that. Don't even jump into Bandit Flower. But, don't expect all other Gundam series to be like that. You might as well just jump from that point, go to G Gundam, or Gundam Seed, maybe, or, um... I would even hazard um, Iron Blooded Orphans for an example. Maybe not so much, but like that's another another take too. But it's too action packy compared to every other Gundam series that you can see. It's very contrasting. Or you know, I would say if you want to start off in the One Year War, because this you know December Sky takes place in the One Year War, then jump into uh, Eighth MS Team. Far more superior in terms of storytelling, and it still has while well, the action's lighter compared to. Uh, December Skies action, it is still a little bit more consistent, and it it manages to tell a well balanced story alongside with its action, rather than being so action and music heavy, and then you know plot slash character driven all the way at the very bottom, you know. 
So that's what I have to say about that one. Definitely avoid these movies if, you, if it's your first time jumping into the Gundam franchise. I would say definitely check out at least December Sky. It's worth a watch. It's fun. I really, really enjoyed it. Which brings me to my final points over here. So overall, when it comes to Gundam Thunderbolt, again, December Sky is an incredible ride with action and music that's akin to like a Clash of the Bands Gundam style, right? But the paper-thin plot of both of the movies and then Bandit Flowers' poor attempt at trying to tell story and character development alongside with that abrupt slowdown in the pace of the storytelling and the movie overall kills this entire series. In fact, it it's so polar about these two movies, I'm going to give you two separate uh, scores alongside with the series overall. So check it out. Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt December Sky gets a 4 out of 5. However, Mobile Suit Gundam Bandit or Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt Bandit Flower gets an abysmal. Oh well, I can't say abysmal, but Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt Bandit Flower gets a 2 out of 5. But wait, there's more. As for Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt, the compilation movies, it gets a solid 3 out of 5. I don't know what else to say about these movies. Um, they're very polar opposites. It feels very much so like the characters of EO and Daryl themselves. EO controlling December Sky and Daryl controlling Bandit Flower. But at the same time, both of them dominate the movies within their own screen times, which is funny. EO had more screen time, or EO's music had more time frame, like, uh, like domination in December Sky. But we focus more so on both characters. I feel a little bit more on Daryl. And then, then Bandit Flower, we are focused more so on EO, but a lot of the music is Daryl's type of music. So, I don't know what to say about that, but I think it's just kind of funny how polar opposite these movies are and how it drastically impacted the overall score. Definitely, if you had a chance, check out December Sky. I highly recommend December Sky. It was a fun action movie. Just treat it as an action movie, and you won't be disappointed. You come in there as a Gundam fan like myself... You're going to be like I, I can hear other Gundam fans going like they're disappointed with this storyline because it was very mediocre. It was OK. Right. But the action, the action is there. The fun in watching that was there. Then you watch Bandit Flower and you're like, what am I watching? What is this garbage? And especially when it's supposed to take place after the one year war where we don't have a whole lot of stories after the one year war. It really didn't add anything to offer to be honest it was its own little side, weird side story that went off on a tangent that didn't fit within the, the realm of post one year war so that's all I have to say regarding Mobile Suit Gundam Thunderbolt um, glad I got a chance to rewatch it a, a second time around too again I really enjoyed um, December Sky not so much so about um, Bandit Flower I will keep trashing Bandit Flower but we are now, at this current point in time, out of the One Year War. December Sky ending at the end of the One Year War, and then Bandit Flower continuing eight months after. Even though we didn't really go a whole lot of anywhere with that eight months, we are now outside of the One Year War. We have now completed every single series release, again, in Japan and North America, regarding the One Year War. Um, actually, that's a little bit of a fib here, because there's... Um, Gundam Evolve, but I don't really count that exactly, but majority of the series, movies, OVAs, ONAs are now covered. We are now leaving, exiting stage right, or sorry, stage right of the uh, One Year War, and we are now moving on to post-war stuff. Now with post-war, we are finally going to be entering into Mobile Suit Gundam 0083. Yes, unlike Gundam 0080, which took place mostly in 0079, this takes place in actual 0083. Three years, it's, well, 
because the uh, the war ended in double uh, technique. Uh, December thirty first, double seventy nine to January first of double eighty. Well, January double first, January first of double eighty. We we saw the treaty uh, signed, a peace treaty signed between both factions. Three years later, we are now coming to our next conflict. So, with that said, on the next, on this nerdy review, we are now going to be reviewing Mobile Suit Gundam, Gundam 0083. Uh, kind of excited to jump back into the series. This is a, a series I really did enjoy uh, watching back on Toonami. I think it was if I remember right, the midnight run for Toonami, because it dealt with some pretty controversial stuff I didn't think, you know, they would actually cover for a while. So, let me let me give you the idea here. So, the story of Gundam 0083. It's basically, we are following federal, uh, federal forces, or Federation forces, that are chasing after the remnants of Xeon, after they've stolen a prototype Gundam, armed with a nuclear weapon, and they vow to exact their plans of reviving Xeon. That's pretty much the gist of the plot, okay? Uh, our characters that we mostly follow, though, we're going to be following Code Rocky right here. Nina, Nina Purpleton, the creator of the, uh, or, yeah, engineer and creator of the prototype Gundams. And then our lead antagonist right here, which is Anna Gato, also known as the Nightmare of Sullivan. I swear, where do these people ever get their nicknames? I, I, I feel like a lot of times when uh, a lot of these ace pilots, when they get their nicknames, the Red Comma, the, um, the Crimson Lightning, the White Wolf of Sullivan. Now we have the Nightmare of Sullivan. I'm like, where do, you, where do they come up with these nicknames? Um, or the Blue Giant, I think, is another one, too, I remember. But I'm like... Who gives them these? I, I want to know. <laughs> but yeah, so we, we, we have our three characters right here. I actually really love a lot of this artwork. That's another thing I want to kind of talk about. So, But before I jump into that. So Gundam 0083 is another OVA series that was made or was released back in 1990. It actually came out right after Gundam 0083, which was in 1989. Um... This is a 13-episode series and is also succeeded two years later with a uh, compilation movie, The Afterglow of Xeon, which I will also be reviewing later in this episode. And um, also came up with two shorts. Uh, one not too long ago, uh, not too long after the series release was called The Mayfly of Space. And then one that came out years later, I believe it was 2000. 15, if I remember correctly here, and it's part two to the Mayfly of Space. Both of those covering a character by the name of Shima in this series. Now, one of the first things I want to talk about this series, and I absolutely love, it is one of the few contending Gundam series in the entire Gundam franchise that has the best overall music. I really dig a lot of the music from this series, uh, especially the uh, first opening, uh, the first opening of this series, and then you know to an extent, I love the first ending or the first uh, closing as well. The second and uh, second opening and closings are okay, but it really shines with that first opening because that one just I feel sets a lot of the tone and expectations of this series. Kind of sad after episode six, we don't hear, we don't get the is that the six or seven, we don't hear from that um, that opening. We go to the second opening, which kind of makes sense. But uh, the overall series, uh, a lot of the music within the series itself, uh, the battle music, or even like the, you know, like the next time episode kind of like clip thingy at the very end of every episode, all that music is just super solid, super awesome. I really love it. It kind of gives you that 90s vibe. I know I'm not saying it right, but it kind of feels almost Top Gunny at times. Um, that said, too... Just like a bunch of a, like a lot of the other '90s Gundam series that was dubbed in the two like ni late '90s to 2000s uh, during the cartoon uh, Cartoon Network Toonami time frame of releasing a lot of Gundam series. Solid voice acting here. Love all the voice actors. Everyone feels and fits their roles appropriately here. Um, I don't think anybody was miscast or did not feel like they were appropriate for their character whatsoever. Um, I can actually kind of say I did hear the Japanese voices too, and that was when I was watching the uh, Afterglow of Xeon because that movie was not dubbed. It was kept strictly only the Japanese, so they didn't take anything from the uh, series itself, no dubbing there. 
And I can say the Japanese voice acting is actually not that bad either. Um, I do feel that some of the characters, though, I did not like their voices. For an example, I really love... I mean, I don't like him as a character, but I really love Mancha's voice actor in the the dubbing. I do not like the Japanese voice actor for Mancha. He sounded too wimpy and not this character that Mancha really liked. The way he looks fits with the voice that was provided to him. This very arrogant, kind of douchey character and um, very... Uh, not flamboyant is a term I'm trying to look for, but more of that, like, um, pervy, pervy kind of dude. Like, kind of like those characters or archetypes in uh, anime. And that's not going to be a good thing. I'll be talking about archetypes in a little bit, too. But um, for voice acting, though, I really love that English voice acting. And I feel like they fit their characters more than the Japanese did this time around. Uh, do 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 Ah, yes. So, um, for here, the for the series itself, the story, the plot is not terribly bad. It's not super, you know, like, well put together. There were some points that just a lot of the story didn't make sense or what was happening. Um, and I will get to it. It's mostly pertaining these three characters together, but um, some things didn't correlate or were put together well enough, like explain a lot more about why Shima does what she does. Um, doesn't explain the love angle between these two. Ha <laughs> spoilers, not really spoilers. And then, um, just focusing a lot, like, in the earlier episodes, focusing a lot on these two here, which I will dive into in just a little bit, too. Um, alongside with the story, though, it's actually, again, a nice good balance between the story and then the mecha fights. A lot of the battle sequences are a lot of fun. Um, I enjoyed watching them uh, for the most part. It does keep you a little bit on, on edge. Exciting. You don't know who's going to survive, so I, I kind of like that perspective. Other than, you know, the main character having plot shield. kind of wish that we get a series where we kind of watch them. We think this is the main character, and then boom, they die like, like a few episodes in or so, you know. Just, just to throw you off, and then we actually have our, our real main character. Just, just to throw you off center, you know. I kind of want that, but... Um, it, the fights are fun, enjoyable, um, and dare I say antagonisty with, with, you know, the whole between Shiro and Anvil at the very beginning, and then later on Shima and then other, um, characters, uh, fighting against Ko and friends. <laughs> um, so I want to talk a little bit more about the characters themselves. So alongside with the plot, we got our character development and, a lot of our time earlier on, we're focusing on Ko and Nina. And I honestly really, I don't want to say hate, it's too strong of a word, but I, I, I can almost say I hate these two characters. Ko doesn't really change in the series, and he kind of remains like, kind of like this hopeless child at times, both emotionally, and he does grow towards the end more independent and more adultish as a fighter and a person, but emotionally he's, he's still like a child and even more childish is Nina for the most part. A lot of times she has this attitude about her and keeps on toying between Ko and then Mancha. I don't know why she does this. It, it's kind of a crappy thing to do to a person. And then spoilers, not spoilers at the very end episode, not even towards the end, like maybe the last two episodes or so, they reveal that, like, oh, she had a relationship with Annabelle, which, or with Gato. Everyone referred to him as Gato. I referred to him as Gato myself. But she had a relationship with Gato. And it, you kind of have an inkling since the beginning, but at the same time, like, it didn't make much sense. Especially, like, oh, we know that they're fighting Gato, but she doesn't express more of this, like, concern for him or whatnot. It's more, like, this distance. And I'm like, they try to make that make sense between the relationship with these two and then the, thing, the stunts that Nina pulls against Ko and then even other people like Mancha, for example, but it didn't make sense again. It, it was like, why are you doing this? Especially when you saw Annabelle, like, in the very first episode, hijack the, the Unit 2, why didn't you have a reaction like, oh my god, that's my ex hijacking my Gundam? No, she like, oh my god, who are you? Stop! And I was like, so this this whole entire angle that he threw out at the very end of the series just 
didn't make any sense. And I I wonder why. Why did you bother do that? What, what was what's the purpose? So it's a little bit frustrating. Um. Oh, give me a second here. The wife is here. Hey, hon. Oh, I right, I'll be right back, guys. I didn't think it was Hey! Get your ass out of here! Oh, I didn't check those ones. I didn't know. If... I, don't, I, don't think I think one did. This one. This is the only one that felt like there's a card in here. Or two. my thingy and make me some more water. Can you take care of this oh. stuff in here? Which me? Yeah. If there's food in here? Yes, I'll take care of it. By the way, our I'm car so registrations sure. came in, so we'll do it tomorrow or something like that. Okay. Um, I, gotta... oh. I forgot to turn on my audio. Uh, I'll be right back again. Ah, damn it. Come on. Click.
Okay, hold on a second. I am coming back. Just gotta resituate myself here. Do apologize for that. The wife did come home, and um, <laughs> oof, sorry about that. Came home. Sometimes she comes back home and she's like, she's done with the farmers markets, and then sometimes she's not done, and then she's just, it's like a kind of like one of those uh, uh, like NASCAR pit uh, pit drive thing or whatnot, where they come into the pit, and I'm like. You know, I'm one of like the engineers or whatnot, just trying to like hurry up, get everything set up. So I'm like, yeah, gotta rush and help, bring in some stuff, take out some stuff, and help her out. So yeah, that was basically it. Um, yeah, and then also update her about what's going on. So I, I didn't realize I didn't have the I had the audio still on. I thought I muted myself, but I guess I didn't. And uh, yeah, you kind of kind of heard of that. So cool, you got a little bit of my life, a whole lot. <laughs> it's funny enough, I'm supposed to do my vlog as I said months ago, and I'm like I. I'm uh, terrible at trying to do vlogs because I don't have a whole lot going on in my life. I'm not donor or demo where I have projects to do or whatnot. This is this is the closest thing I have to a project right now. So, like, yeah, but, you know, there's not much for me to vlog. Maybe I could do, you know, a vlogging review. You know, I try to do that in the past. It's not almost the same. Anyways, though, let, let me continue where we last left off. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, yeah, so I, I just want to kind of recap, just a recap on these, um, on these three awful lovers. Like, you know, I don't mind Gato as much. He feels too much of a zealot at times, but... The series does give him reason, explanation. Ko has some cluelessness to him. Here's, here's Nero. Say hi. <laughs> uh, but Ko does have his cluelessness, and then Nina has her tendencies. Is the best way I can describe it. Oh no, Nero smacked my uh, keyboard. Do not delete. Do not say yes to you. his tail smacked my inner key and wanna delete one of my scenes. Like, don't do that. Don't 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 do that. Don't do that. Sit. Sit and relax. No, I don't want to scratch or stop it. <laughs> I don't know if you can see his tail like flack my keyboard or not. Yeah, let me scoot forward so you can't do that anymore. Anyways, I apologize. Uh, but, yeah, these, these characters, just, they were just okay. They were mediocre. Like, it was mediocre about their love side. It didn't make much sense why Nina was doing what she was doing. And it it was just poor character explaining in that in that sense. This is going to be more prevalent in the movie when I describe it. Or <laughs> when I re get to that point of review. Uh, the other thing, too, I didn't like was that, you know, like, uh, they did, like, a terrible attempt kind of like to copy some sense of like you know previous series so in this case here's kind of like a char and sailor thing like where nina knew knows gato but she doesn't she tries to play it off and i feel like it was it was a really terrible way kind of like copying like how sailor knows char and in this case not as lovers <laughs> that that'd be kind of weird um but more so as you know like siblings and she know that's that's his brother after confirming it, though, like, we go through the series and see that development happen. Here, it's like, you know who Ana Valgato is. You've dated the dude, and you couldn't recognize him, let alone going throughout the entire time that they're doing this thing, really, like, talk about it or say anything about it or do much about it. And, it's like, it's not the same as Sailor where she internalizes it, but she's still going about her thing. Nina does it in such a... In a piss poor way where it's messing with Ko or messes with other other people too. So I'm like, I felt like it was just a poor version of that. Apologize for that too. My allergies are now kicking back up and the the um, and his mean is not working anymore. I should probably take another pill in about an hour or so. <laughs> it's one of those 24-hour ones from, like, Costco. Um, 
the other thing too that disappointed me about the series was the whole last episode. Um, it, that's just because they cramped so much into that last episode. And it's weird because they, they know their budget. They know what they're trying to tell with the story. And they just cram so much into it. Uh, we got that whole love angle with Nina and Gato. Um, and they tried to cram in more so. And I felt this was super egregious because this series is known for what is the bridge, the gap between Mobile Suit Gundam and Zeta Gundam. There is a eight year gap. Or in this case, a seven-year gap between the end of the One Year War and when the Grips conflict, Grips War occurred. What happened during that time frame? Gundam Dillo '83 was supposed to be the middle one between those two, you know. And we don't really see a whole lot about this development about uh, Titans or whatnot. And this is where I say, like, it, like some of the things that didn't make sense, like with uh, Admiral. Cohen, and then we, we see Jami Top. We see like characters that appear in Zeta, but they're like very throw in there, kind of like I was here. Like I have a, a quick screen moment here, and I have a quick couple of lines, and that's it. The cash in for that. That's what it felt like to me. Like we see Amon, uh, Amon from Zeta and, and Double Zeta. She has one quick scene and like two or three lines. That's it. Never see her throughout the entire series again. Uh, we see Jabitov one time. That was pretty much it. Like, maybe like two throwaway lines. We see Basque a couple of times. We do see how vicious... Actually, not a couple. We see him like, actually a, a good amount in one episode. So we get to see Basque and how vicious he can be, too. But other than that, wasn't by a whole lot, though. Um, this series was, again, the sort of that bridge gap, but also explain, like, how and why Titans formed. And the last episode crams all that in there. So all of a sudden, like, now we have, uh, after the events of what happened with Operation Stardust, um, you know, like, Titans kind of form and whatnot, and then Ko gets put on trial and goes to prison? Serve time is the best I can understand it, but I would assume prison or something like that. And they just kind of like rush it. The last, like, minute of the entire series is, like, Oh, we're flashing in how we're, we're putting in the Titans. Oh my god, Titans, yeah! I'm like, really? That's it? We're not going to see like this slow development of it. It's just that all of a sudden we had this build-up through 0083, and it was taking place in, the, in about a month's time frame. And then all that development, but we don't see the development of how the Titans... I'm, now, I'm not a fan of Titans at all. I actually hate the Titans. I can say that with confidence. I hate the Titans. And, um, it just bothered me how, like, I would like to know a little bit more about, like, how they came to power or how they came to be. Not just, okay, Operation Stardust happened, and then here's, like, one minute of just, like, you know, screen caps of, you know, people starting to uh, dress up a speech from, um, Basque, and then that's it. But that was it. I'm like, no, there there's, needs to be a little bit more. I want more explanation, but man, that's the best we get. So I, I was a little bit disappointed that... It wasn't truly like what it was to deliver to the fans, and it was so, so last minute, quite literally last minute of the episode, and last minute thought just throwing it in there. Oh, oh yeah, this is how Titans are made. Okay, I just felt it was just, it was not sufficient enough. I would like to see more of a progression or development throughout the entire series, like maybe Basque and Jami Tom's involvement. Um, Amon's uh, Amon's uh, involvement with access, uh, access and stuff like that, or her, her building resentment towards Char, even though we don't see Char in the series. I want to see more about that, but we don't get any of that at all. That it just becomes kind of like I showed up here, I am, and then that's it. <laughs> Didn't really like that a whole lot. Uh, before I jump into some of the other, like the other two little segments, I like to do here. I want to talk about Afterglow of Xeon, the compilation movie. And I'm not trying to give away how I really feel about the movie. So let me tell you this. The compilation movie was released two years after the OVAs came out and literally crams the entire 13 episode series into two hour movies. That's not something unfamiliar for us because we've seen other compilation movies such as the original Mobile Suit Gundam trilogy where it, co it collapses 42 episodes into three two 
to uh, two to two and a half hour. No, no, it's two hour movies, I believe. If I'm not mistaken, I can't remember now. Um, or we got the new translation of Zeta Gundam movies, or we got compilation movies from Seed, or from um, uh, Gundam, uh, Gundam, uh, Gundam Age, and I can name a bunch more, like Turn A, for an example. There's a bunch of other compilation movies that are out there too, but this one crams 13 episodes into the two hour movies and I don't know how it failed so spectacularly. Um, actually I can tell you why it failed so spectacularly. The movie is an incredibly bloated, horribly edited, nonsensical expositional mess of a movie. Um, it is, I'm going to say it out there flat out. It is easily one of the worst compilation movies in the entire Gundam franchise easily and i've seen all the compilation movies honestly honestly i have not seen after glow of xeon until i had gotten this uh box set because uh just like 0083 or 008 or sorry 8th ms team when i bought my first set of gundam double 80 or blue or gundam dvds it was a bootleg lo and behold and it was a bootleg that just played it all episodes but didn't have after glow of xeon in there this this little set from Rate Stuff, re-released from Anime Legends, does have it, in fact. And, um, I was thinking about skipping it, but I'm like, yeah, well, you know what, I want to experience all of Gundam, and, you know, a compilation movie is very different than what the series can ever offer to you, because, obviously, you're cramming everything from an expanded series that can range from, like, six to eight hours to, like, 20 to 25 hours something like that right into only a two-hour movie so in this case here we have 13 episodes i'm not going to try to do the math here but you got 13 episodes trying to cram into two hour and two hour, two hour movie it's definitely going to alter some things how they're going to do it and you know depends on how the editing the director feels about it and how it was edited together and this is where the movie really 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 fails so let me try and get myself kind of coordinated here because I don't want to be a mess like this this movie. I keep putting point to the DVD or Blu-ray. Mess like Afterglow of Xeon. Now, I'm not talking about Gundam 0083 the series, okay? I want to keep that very, very clear. 0083 the series is good. Good. The compilation movie Afterglow of Xeon is bad. Here's why. So much of the pacing of the movie feels very super janky and uneven. It kind of goes from expositional narration, which is done most, it's not most, it's done by Nina. And it makes it feel like she is the main character of the movie, yet she is shown not as, not as much as other characters, or in this case, like Ko, or to a lesser extent, uh, Gato. But it's narrated by Nina a lot of the, a lot of the movie itself. And trying to give exposition to things that are being literally cut out of the entire movie. Such as the majority of the chasing, um, the Gundam jacking itself, um, narration about like certain kind of events and, and things like that. So really, really cut a lot of that out of there. But it was uneven. So it goes, it goes from like expositional to like to co or like some kind of weird explanation or some kind of following. Because like you would think it's like we're following a specific character or whatnot because that's how... It was set up for the first 20 minutes of the movie. And then we later on go into a different transition. And then we go right back to this and then to that. And like it, it, it shifts in so many weird paradigms. It's, it's again, uneven. It feels wonky and cattywampus watching it. Um, again, it's weird that she, they focus her as the main character when Ko was primarily the main character throughout the entire series. He had the most screen time, I felt, besides Nina. And... They don't even use up most of the screen time that Nina had from the series into the movie. So it's just some, like, a lot of scenes with her, too, but mostly it's just her voice actress narrating events. Speaking of which, so with that, as much as they made Nina seem like a main character, and this is where I say it feels really janky, is that all the other characters, including Ko, Ko, the main character, pretty much the main protagonist in the entire series, feels more like a side character. Everything that involved him either feels more like an afterthought or they were like, oh, wait, we, we want to add this in here to give him a little bit of character, but it doesn't make it. It doesn't work out. And here's some examples of this. Right. So like um, 
this is where the, again, horrible editing and cutting to the movie just, it was awful. So, like, so, certain things were kept in the movies, like, uh, in the movies, such as, like, uh, co helping Kelly build the Valvaro. But the problem was, we don't see the fight afterwards. The whole point of that was the develop in the series, build Co's Ko, character to be more, be more of an adult, basically, and come out of his shell and be a lot less fearless about certain things that had happened in the series itself. We don't even get that. And they're trying to say, oh, it's to help him develop to be more of an... I'm like, but we don't get that fight. We don't get any of that. We don't get any bring-ups of the future. Certain character deaths that happen in the series, we don't see it in the movie here. Which play character plays role to Cove's character. But taking those character deaths out has no relevance. It's funny enough, too, that we see these characters, and then all of a sudden, throughout the, the timeline of, uh, time run of the movie, they just kind of disappear, and you go like, Wait, whatever happened to this character? Where where is he? Where's this character? Where did they go? We're at the final battle. Where where are they? They were on the Albion. Those sort of things. Um, other cuts too, such as Chima, and Chima was already a hard character to understand because she had the a lesser screen time in the series, and it's even cut down further more in the movies. It makes her seem like this vengeful person for no reason whatsoever or giving a little bit more detail to her vengefulness. It's just, she just feels so archetypical of like an evil villainess, you know? And Gato just feels like a villain zealot. They took most of his backstory away, explaining why he's doing what he's doing or why he's motivated to do what he's doing. They kind of threw in the, the backstory a little bit of the, of what we saw in the one year war, but they took majority of it away, and it took away what made Gato Gato. And so he's just like, "I'm for Zeon, Zeon, Zeke Zeon," and you're like, "Oh, I'm gonna revive Zeon." Like that's it. There's no like reasoning to why he does what he does or why he's motivated beyond revival of Zeon. Um. So let me see if there's any other cuts I could uh, remember. I, I'm going off my head here and kind of looking back at my notes too. Oh, even better. Uh, why does at the very end of the movie, I already mentioned it before too, but why does Ko go to court? And in the movie, they they mentioned about going to La Vie and Rose, but they cut that entire episode out with the exception of the last part of the episode where we can see um, federal soldiers shooting at Ko, and that's about it. We, we even take out, I forgot, the engineer, the Anaheim Electronics engineer who dies that episode. Spoilers, I'm sorry, but she's just like one of those characters that shows up and dies. It's one of those ones. So I'm completely throw it. But it was important because that episode explains why Ko later on gets court-martialed is because he technically uh, steals the Gundam even though he was ordered not to pilot the Gundam or whatnot. But the movie doesn't give any inclination to that. Like, why do you even bother keep the court scene and why do you even bother keeping that particular part of the scene when you can say, oh, we're going to go to the Levian Rose, go to the and Rose, get the Gundam, and that's it. <coughs> so that did not make sense whatsoever. Um, also, we get one new little exclusive scene where we see, like, Nina's shuttle getting closer to the Ko's Gundam towards the end, but, uh, completely takes out the ending scene where Ko comes, uh, gets out of, uh, uh, his hard time because of the Gundam project was, um, erased, the data and everything was erased, so therefore none of, like, none of his prison time should be served and all that jazz like that, but when he returns the base, the, he, we don't see the scene where he returns the base, sees... Uh, Keith, um, Mara, and Nina at all. We don't get that reunion. I'm like, so what's the whole point? Why even have even some semblance of some kind of relationship or love between Nina and Co? Why not just scrap all that love out and throw it out the window? It made no sense. So it was just really, really frustrating about that. Uh, the movie just ends super abruptly, kind of like the series does, but it's like, as much as. I did not appreciate the ending of 0083, the series, and how abrupt it kind of felt, too, because everyone was crammed in that last minute. At least that gave you a minute versus, like, not even 10 seconds of an actual ending for uh, for the movie. The movie just basically starts playing credits while using all the, like, you know, like the Titans formation stuff, which is not even quite even a full minute or so. And I was just, I was stunned by that. It was just appalling i'm like why why are we getting at least some kind of a decent or good ending and when i talk about how messy the editing is too 
In the series, you can follow along from beginning to end and understand what's going on with the plot, even though with some characters it's a little harder to understand, like Chima, for an example. But everything's pretty much laid out. Even with Nina's last-minute like love affair with, with Gato was thrown at the very end, it still made sense to some point. I mean, I, I'll, I'll bet I'm not a fan of that. I didn't like it. It was a terrible way to throw that in there at the last minute for a, some random little twist. The movie doesn't tell a very cohesive story. The best thing you can get out of all this was Gundam stolen, Gundam uses nuke, and they fight for a colony, which we don't even see the aftermath or anything like we don't we don't even understand it. It's just like so much contextual stuff and it's just what? Anyways, so that's that's pretty much Afterglow of Zeon terrible awful um compilation film. I want to take just a little smidgen of time to talk about the Mayfly of Space shorts. There's two of them. One came out, um, I can't remember, like shortly after the series had concluded before the movie, which is a, a three and a half minute short about Chima, giving a little bit more explanation to her character. I wish this was actually in the series, though. Um, she kind of has like nightmares and she freaks out. She looks very uncharacteristic than, than how she is portrayed in the series because she's always seen like super villainous and one of the oh kind of characters, right? But um, the short actually gives her a little bit more character. And uh, we see a little bit of a flashback of why she's like this, which is basically because she saw because uh, she participated in Operation British and didn't realize that the operation required them gassing the colony before dropping it on Earth. So uh, I can understand that feel of betrayal and that frustration and an upset at um, her at the officials and stuff like that and at um, Zeon in general. Uh, so that was the first short. Actually, we didn't see too much of that argument. We see that more so in the second short, which came out in 2000. I want to say, was it 2010, 2015? I can't remember. But it was more of a still short. There was using a lot of scenes from the first Mayfly of Space. And then um, a lot of these like kind of like live action comic stills that you would see, right? It's voice, but it's like more like panels almost. Um, and some some limited animation too. But we see like more conflict between like when Gato and her first meet and why she resents Gato, um, again, uh, resentment towards Zeon in general because of how she was being commanded to do what she was supposed to uh, do. So what she was supposed to do during Operation British and so forth. So it gave a little bit more character to her. Honestly, I felt like the second one could be a little, it's a little bit more of a throwaway episode, a throwaway short. And I would rather keep the first one. I wish the first one was actually in the series and they could probably squeeze that in there. Maybe throw away more of that Nina Ko time and put in that for Chima just to give her, more reason to be why she is what she is in the series. That's my two cents on that one, at least. Um, that that said, moving on to the next one here, I do want to talk about the suits. And definitely, I, I'm i going to say this much, though. So, this part of the segment here is, again, you know, um, every single series of Gundam brings in a new slew of suits, designs, redesigns, and so forth. So... I just want to point out some of the, the suit designs that I actually really liked in this particular series. I do want to say, though, with Gundam Double 83, I was not a fan with a lot of the designs. A lot of the Federation designs are really, really ugly looking GMs or gun cannons. I did not like their designs whatsoever. Let me see if I can get the... Is it the Power Jam or is it Custom? No, no. That one actually... Excuse me. Looks kind of cool. Is it the custom? No, it's not the quell. Here we go. Here's an example of one of the GMs. Now, this one looks like it looks decent, but when you start seeing it in action, it looks really weird and janky and kind of crappy looking. I did not like it. These weird, like, um, des like designs slash um, details just really, really off put me. I don't know why. It just it looks ugly to me. Um, even like with the, the main Gundam, so this is the first version of it, just like following tradition with Gundam, uh, we're not going to see this tradition until, um, cause this came out much later. Of course, this came in the 1990s, but, um, starting with Zeta Gundam, we're going to start a tradition. I'll talk about this more about, you know, we're going to start off with the first Gundam in the series and then midway through, we're either going to get the, we're going to get an upgrade to the Gundam or we're going to get the, uh, main suit. Basically, so in this series, it's more of an upgrade, though. So we have the, the first suit here, which is it's kind of a boring design. It's very eh looking. And then you get here's the upgrade of it. Um, 
uh, after what seven, se uh, six or seven episode six or seven, and this is the newer suit right here. Um, the full vernier is okay looking. I mean, it's got some cool designs like with the extra vernier in the front that pop out, or you can see that the wings uh, turn around and, and allow the zip around in space. So that that's kind of cool and all, but it's really an okay design. I, I, I wasn't really thrilled by it. And everybody's favorite when they come into this series, everybody loves the, and I can never pronounce his name correctly, the Debo, Deborum, uh, Dendrobum. Dendrobium? Dendrobium? I cannot say its name. But they also love the star, uh, Stamen. And, uh, you know, Stamen's okay. It looks like a very bland, boring Gundam look. Um, Funny enough, like, sometimes the suits, like, the legs look bigger than the body or whatnot. This is actually pretty accurate. I don't know, a little bit less, because the legs are smaller in the series. Not as, like, not as robust as it looks here. But it's an okay design. I think a lot of people kind of like it because the wing binders. Hmm. <sighs> Hi. I think a lot of people kind of like this design because of the wing binders. It's kind of very similar to the Hayaku Shiki, almost. But I, I didn't care for either of these designs. I... It was okay. That being said, though, there are some things, and you know, like even on the Xeon side, most of the Xeon suits are pretty much what we've already seen. The Rick Dom 2s look like Rick Doms that we've seen. Not much of a big di difference between them. Um, the Gelgooks look a little bit different because they're the Gelgook Marine, so they're a little bit more beefier looking, but eh. We get some mobile armors to uh, Valvaro, and then, of course, the Noiseal, which are not terribly bad designs. Let me try and see if I can pop them up without just, just, you know, name dropping them. So I like, just, uh, oh, am I on the wrong one here? I am on the wrong one here. I apologize. I, this is from our previous review. Let me just go ahead and just close those up so I don't jump around into those constantly. So, I mean, like, here we got Valvaro. Oh, sorry. Why did I do that twice? <laughs> I tapped Valvaro. Valvalo. I heard it, it. I always pronounce it with another V, Valvaro. Yeah, it's an okay design here. Very crab-esque looking, right? And then you have the noise zeal. Anyone who's played Gundam Battle Assault on the PlayStation remembers this dude here. Such a pain of a boss. <laughs> um, and, and just to give you an idea, like look, look, the Rick Dom Two doesn't look any more different than what we've seen like from previous series. What is this? Okay, this one looks a lot better. <laughs> That's from a side story though. Um, so yeah, and we get a couple of new ones, like the Draxi, which is a, a very, um, it's literally a scrap mobile suit put together. So, eh. It's an, it's, it's an okay one. Um, yeah, I'll throw in Gerber Terra, which is kind of neat looking. <coughs> Sorry. Oh, it looks a little... I'll roll out version. Okay, I see. But yeah, this is what we see. This is actually more closer to what it looks like in this. This is actually what it looks like in the series. It's neat. It's actually a Gundam that was changed up to look like this by Chima. Yeah, it, it, it had its short moment, like an actual Mayfly itself. Lives for just a moment and then gets swallowed up by all the madness that's happening. Um, But of all the designs, though, this series did bring forth one of my most favorite Zakus of all time. The MSO6 F2, Zaku 2 type F2. Easily one of my favorite Zakus. Um, the design looks very similar to most, most Zakus, mostly taking uh, from the original. I know it's more of the J version with you can see the extra thrusts and so forth. So it's all I'm going to have to say about why it's my favorite. It's quite easily my favorite because it is basically. The final version of the Zaku. There's many versions of a Zaku, but this is the final version of the Zaku. Uh, taking all the positives from previous designs or makes and cutting all the negative crap out of them. So, like, like I was talking Gundam Delo 80, for example. They had a really cool design. That thing had, had fuel consumption issues. This thing takes the, the vernier and all that uh, thrust output, but uh, compensates and deals with that thrust output and uh, low uh, low uh, work time. So, yeah. This suit is the best version a Zaku could ever get. And that's why the Zaku 2 F2 is my favorite. But it, it introduces my favorite Zaku. The design for it, actually, this is, not, this is not what the series looks like. This is more what it actually looks like in the series. I just love the design of it for the most part. 
Um, just more robust looking Zaku, more beefy, a little bit, not, not too beefy. It's like, it's not like a beefcake, but it's kind of like, it's got a little bit of the beefiness. It's got a little bit of the, the, the spherical look of the Zaku still and maintains all the positives. Despite that it's calling, uh, despite Keith calling it a crappy old suit. I still think it's fantastic. Um, that said too, of all the Gundams introduced in this series, I actually like Unit 2. Um, the G the RX-78 GPO-2A Gundam Faisalis. They never say the name Faisalis. They always call it Unit 2 in the, mo in the series. So, or the movie 2, but... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. It, I think it's one of the cooler, cooler looking Gundams. It's kind of sad it doesn't have any other armaments, because, like, mostly in the series, it just uses its beam sabers and the head Vulcans. And it does some kind of, like, little, like, flip kicks, too, which are kind of cool. And of course, we do see it use its its nuke at some point in the series, which is another like crazy, crazy cool moment, Tra like tragic, horrifying, but crazy cool at the same time. Um, yeah, I mean, like there's not a whole lot of designs I liked in this series, but those are those are some things I did really enjoy uh, seeing introduced into the Gundam universe, and particularly the use Universal Century uh, portion, at least. All right, that being said, I kind of want to jump into our next little segment I like to do, which is, I'm new to Gundam. Should I start with this series first? <sighs> this one's a little bit hard for me. It's really, really iffy for me to say yes or no. I'm going to try and be more definitive in giving you straighter answers, though. And honestly, I'm going to say no. Don't start on 0083 first. Um... The reason for this one is based off, off of something that's already concurrent or happening. You wouldn't really understand the motivations behind Zeon. Watching it, it feels more like they're zealots and they're crazy and all that jazz and the Federation of the Good Guys. But then you find out that they're slowly becoming the bad guys because they're turning into Titans. And I, I think it's just I'm looking at more of a story or a story aspect. Otherwise, if, if you because I'm looking at, at the franchise whole or at least in the Universal Century perspective. And I think this is a terrible way to start. It drops you right in the middle between two different conflicts slash wars with a new conflict itself, and you're not given much historical context of what's going on. You wouldn't really appreciate why why this series is, is important within the timeline itself. Um, that said, too, like the characters are very if iffy too. I like a majority of the support cast and some of the uh, some of the antagonists, but our main characters, such as like Nina and Co tend to fall flat, very one-dimensional archetypical type of characters, which I just don't like. And I, I don't think a lot of people will gel with these characters either. Um, so I, I would just say, no, do not start with this first. I would definitely say check it out later. But for your first series, no, don't start on 0083. Not at all. And definitely... Definitely stay away from the compilation movie that is uh, uh, Afterglow of Xeon. I usually would say, like, you know, maybe watch a compilation movie instead of the series. So that way you, you can get, like, everything in a nice little bite size sit through rather than, you know, going through an entire series. This is one of the few compilation movies I'm going to say stay away from. Do not watch. You are better off watching the full series than watching that garbage, Okay. Time is better spent watching the series or anything else or doing anything else rather than watching that compilation movie. Okay? I wasted my two hours. I'm going to save you two hours. Don't watch it. Don't do not do not do that to yourself. Don't torture yourself. Um, with that, I'm going to give you kind of that overall here. Uh, with that, so here's the overall, right? So Gundam 0083, uh, so <clears throat> sorry, I'm going to just kind of reset myself here. I kind of jumped the gun because I really hated that movie. I'm not joking. I really hated the afterglow of Xeon. So I will talk about that, get it more capsizable. But um, yeah, give me a second here. <clears throat> Try to collect myself. All right. So overall... Mobile Suit Gundam 0083 is kind of what fans were asking for about ask about providing us that little bit of a time frame of what happened that 
the exponential gap between the original Mobile Suit Gundam and Zeta Gundam. That seven year gap. What happened in that time frame? And what the series gives us is the explanation of what had happened, what caused basically the how and why the Titans were formed, the catalyst to their creation, alongside with um uh, Dang it, I, I got myself lost again. <laughs> let me let me just read my note real fast here, what I wanted to say about it real quick. Oh, okay, that, that, that. So, I apologize, so. Overall, Mobile Suit Gundam 0083 gives what fans are asking you for regarding the gap time frame between the original Mobile Suit Gundam and Zeta Gundam. That nice seven year gap, we now have something that explains in the middle of how the Titans, how and why the Titans were formed and created and the catalyst towards them. It has some entertaining fights and a decent story, but much of it is ruined by the lack of character development between Ko and Nina and focusing more so with their love story that didn't make a whole lot of sense and them just being cookie cutter archetype characters. So it really kind of hinders and, and breaks the series a little bit. I apologize. That sounds terrible. <laughs> Take three. Uh, I don't want to like read it off. From there, I like I did, I did. Sometimes my notes are like they're short and they, they they allow me to elaborate myself like I want to, and then sometimes I just put out there what I wanted to say, and I it's kind of like one of those I want to say something cool. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I just, I just want to make it nice because it, it's gonna be an episode, right? And I'm gonna be cutting this, so I just want to make it look nice. Being honest, so I apologize if I'm gonna do another take here. Ooh, Revenge of of Wendy's. <laughs> It's getting, it's getting me like a little like um, not gassy. I'm sorry. I'm getting TMI here. Sorry. All right, I'm gonna stop. Stop. <sighs> okay. So overall, Mobile Suit Gundam 0083 gives what fans are asking for. Basically, an explanational time frame that gap between the original Mobile Suit Gundam and Zeta Gundam, with some interesting fights and a decent plot. However, a lot of that's ruined with a lot of the focus on the love story between Nina and Ko, and then making them into more of these archetypical, archetypical characters rather than something unique for the series. It really just drags down the entire series overall due to this. <coughs> Man, I sound terrible. I apologize. Okay, so like here's the thing is like I was saying like it's basically it would be a better series if we had focused less on the love story between Ko and Nina and focused more on the actual story. And like like it would be a better story if we focused more on the actual story and less on Nina and Ko's love story alongside with actually making them into actual characters rather than cookie cutter archetype characters. Yeah. All right, from the top, we're doing to number four. This is all. I'm still gonna post this all live. Uh, post this again, so you're gonna see me like flub up and see like, hey, here, here you go. You get the um, flub ups. I, w I wish I got some. I got some people to comment on this or laugh at me, but that's okay. I, I can always settle for the future. <laughs> Anyways, so for the overall. Mobile Suit Gundam 0083 gives fans what we've been asking for for the most part regarding the gap time frame between Mobile Suit Gundam and Zeta Gundam. Um, it gives us an explanation of how and why the Titans are formed and the catalyst towards them while offering entertaining mecha fights alongside with a subpar story uh, for the most part. Um, it would have been a much better series if we focused more so on the story, though, and not focusing a lot of this love story stuff between Ko and Nina, and then actually making them actual characters rather than archetypical cookie, uh, cookie cutter cookie cutter characters. I swear, I can't, I can't, I can't word today. All right, so overall. Mobile Suit Gundam 0083 gives fans what we've been asking for. That explanation between the gap between the original Mobile Suit Gundam and Zeta Gundam. With some entertaining mecha fights and a subpar uh, story plot. 
Um, it would have been a better series if we focused more so on the story rather than the love story between Ko and Nina, and then actually making them to actual characters rather than cookie cutter archetypes. Mobile Suit Gundam 0083 gets a 3 out of 5. As for the Afterglow of Zeon, the compilation movie, the awful, horrible, disgusting compilation movie, stay away from it. Stay away from it. Seriously. Um, it is the worst waste of two hours ever. Um, poorly edited, poorly told, really cuts up the series in ways that it shouldn't have been cut, gives no explanation to certain characters while giving over-explanation on certain characters, while having an overarching um, exposition narration by Nina doesn't make a whole lot of sense. The plot becomes so paper thin, it's it's laughable. You're better off wasting two hours of your time watching other things or other Gundam series or even the actual series of 0083 than this compilation movie. Trust me when I say this. I wasted my two hours. I'm trying to save you yours. Mobile Suit Gundam... 0083, the afterglow of Xeon, gets an appalling, an abysmal 1 out of 5. Seriously, avoid that movie. Um, I've already mentioned this before, but other compilation movies have something else that you can really, really cherish or bring something new to the table. Sometimes th that new thing is not that great. But the editing that is done for Afterglow of Xeon is awful. It's uneven, janky, character development's not even there, it can't even decide who to focus on for a character, and then everybody's motivations, or even the plot itself, almost makes no sense at times. Better off skipping that entirely. Cool. So, with that said, we are now, literally, we are at the tail end, oh, sorry, got the wrong move set up here. Tail end of the One Year War, Right? We came out eight, eight months later of the One Year War, and that's kind of tossable, right? And then the real the real star here is that it, we did go um, we did go out of the uh, One Year War, and now we are definitely post war stuff with 0083. But that's not where the Gundam franchise stops, ladies and gentlemen. For now, we are now heading forward. Done with the largest part of the Universal Century, we are now moving forward into different timelines. We are now going to be moving forward um, from Gundam 0083 four years later into 0087, where we are going to be focusing on Zeta Gundam. This series is something I've been wanting. This is so it's funny when I started doing these reviews, right? Um, it was because I wanted to rewatch a couple of series, right? Uh, the series I wanted to rewatch, I've been hangry and I can't wait until I get to it, which is um, I wanted to rewatch Gundam Wing, and I really want to rewatch Zeta Gundam. Uh, so I'm excited to start this all over again. This will be my, let me see, I watched it on the DVD versions first three different times. I've watched this set once. This will be my second time watching it, so it'll be my fifth time watching Zeta Gundam. I really do enjoy Zeta Gundam, it's a great series. So I'm excited to finally jump into this again. Um, that being said, too, as I mentioned with compilation movies, Zeta Gundam, just like the original Gundam, has a compilation movie set itself. And it's actually newer, too. Uh, so we are going to have, um, potentially, if I have enough time to squeeze it all in here, we're going to be doing um, the uh, Mobile Suit Gundam Zeta Gundam, or Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam, a new translation, which covers three movies... Uh, Heir to the Stars, Lovers, and then uh, Love is the Pulse of the Stars. So we'll, we'll jump into that too. Um, I I know one thing I do not like, two things I don't like about that movie, but I'm not going to say anything just yet. And then finally, I'm not excited at all for this. I've been dreading for this. I don't... I think I'm going to get it to it this week, to be honest, and I'll be kind of glad. Because, you know, it's like after you shoot something very, very awesome, then you got to shoot something really, really, really nasty. ZZ Gundam is after Zeta. Literally a year later, 
after the Grips War slash conflict, we get into the Neo Zeon, the first Neo Zeon War. <coughs> I want to say I, I I would love to see another Zeon based fight, but um, ZZ Gundam is a very hard series to watch, in my opinion. I've only watched it once on that Blu-ray set. I've seen it bits and pieces of episodes in the past, but not fully like I did when I got that set right there. I'm not looking forward to watching Zeta or ZZ Gundam. It's like, I'm really looking forward to Zeta Gundam. ZZ Gundam. I'm like, please, can I just skip that and move to the next next time part of the timeline here? And I'm like, nope, I got to watch that next. I'm dreading it. I'm really dreading it. I hate ZZ Gundam. Okay, and here's here's preliminary reasons why I don't like ZZ Gundam. ZZ Gundam... From what I remember about Zeta Gundam, right? I like Zeta Gundam because it was it was the Game of Thrones-esque. True Game of Thrones of the Gundam franchise. I'm sorry, I'm, I have an itchy nose. I'm about to sneeze again. Where... Tomino... Yoshi, Yoshi, Yoshiyuki Tomino, the director and writer, uh, got very, uh, well, I guess when he's depressed, he tends to create some of the best content, I guess, because he was depressed when he was writing Zeta Gundam, and he was just killing characters left and right, and it's characters that, like, you you build some establishment with them. It's not like one of like those, like, you know, one episode characters. No, he, you build some establishment with these characters, and then he kills them in front of you, and it, it matters. And I was like, dang! I like this character. What the heck? It's not like Game of Thrones where it's like, you don't really expect it. Uh, you expect it in Game of Thrones. Like, oh, I'm not going to bother getting attached to any character because they're going to kill him off. So I'm just going to watch it and enjoy the series of events, right? Zeta Gunman, you don't expect any of this. And where he gets his nickname, Kill Mall Tomino, really, really applies in Zeta Gundam. So I'm... I, I enjoy that. Not that I like seeing characters die or whatnot, but like, when, they, when the characters die... It, it has an impact. It's like, you don't expect that. It happens throughout the entire series. It's like one of those, it keeps you kind of like on the edge because you never know. You never know. And then ZZ Gundam came out, and I guess because the popularity of Gundam, keep in mind, so the original Gundam came out. That's the first one. A sequel series came out with ZZ Gun or Z Gundam, and then ZZ Gundam came out. Now, the first two, well, the first one's kind of kiddish, and it became a little bit more adult. The second series is definitely an adult. Third one is like the Sunrise was going, hey, Tommy, we want you to make this uh, kid-friendly now. Knock off the killing. Knock off all the seriousness. You can have your war, but uh, you gotta make it kid-friendly. And that's what I don't like about ZZ Gundam. The entire cast, it's literally a ship almost, like, the whole entire cast is filled with kids. And Bright is the only adult. I hate everybody in that series. With the exception of Bright and, and some older characters, I hate everybody in that series. It is not enjoyable to watch. Okay, hold on. I like Amon too. She's one of, she's one of my favorite villainesses in the Gundam franchise. But, oh god. I'm just not excited. It's very childish, very stupid a lot of times. Oh, some of the stuff. I'm just remembering some of the things I remember, like, with Mashi Mashiro. I, think, I can't pronounce his name correctly. And Glemmy Toto. Oh, my lord. You know, I like the uh, I like the idea of a Zeon Civil War, but... Uh, the people, the, the way they do go about it is so terrible. Um, I think after ZZ Gundam, though, I haven't looked forward enough to... After ZZ, so, you know, Zeta Gundam and then the direct sequel. So Zeta Gundam is supposed to be a, is a sequel to the original Mobile Suit Gundam, not a direct sequel because it doesn't take place, like, you know, right afterwards. Z Gundam happens in 0087. ZZ Gundam happens right after Zeta Gundam. Like, right at the end of it, too. Like, continues right after. That's why it's a direct sequel, and it happens in 0088. After 0088, we're, if I'm not mistaken here, my time frame, because I don't have my, my Blu-rays out, but if I remember correctly, it should be Char Char's counterattack happening in 0093 with the second Neo Zeon War. That's something I'm going to be looking for. So I'm, I, I get to have this delicious, mm, superb, like, steak. I get 
this is the I, I want to say this like the beef Wellington. I, 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 I've only had one time beef. Well, I've only had beef Wellington once in my life. It was so delicious. Or you know what? Another thing I can compare this to too that I actually have fatty tuna, fresh fatty tuna, off the shores, cut up by a chef right then and there, fresh fatty tuna. That that's what that's what Zeta Gundam is in the Gundam franchise, from what I'm remembering at least. And then, after taking a delicious bite of that Wellington, or um, or enjoying that Wellington, or enjoying a uh, nice fatty tuna platter or whatever, you literally have to bite into shit. You have to bite into shit. You can't spit. You chew on that for a little bit and you swallow it. That's easy. I don't know. I don't know you guys how much I'm dreading watching ZZ. But at least I know after that, you get to wash out that bad taste with some really fine wine. I'm not a wine connoisseur. I'm just I'm just putting analogies out there. But I'm going to you know get some fine wine and down it out. And we're going to capsize what I feel is is the pinnacle of the UC era with Char's counterattack. We will be going after Char's counterattack, which we will come into three years later in 0096 with Unicorn Gundam, and I believe narr Gundam Narrative takes place one year after, and 0097, and then there's Hathaway's Flash, which um, has not been out, has not released to US just yet. Who knows? Maybe it'll release in time. I don't know. I doubt it. Or I'll have to come back to it in the future. Um, but that would be some time. I don't know what that movie is going to be about. I think it's actually in two or three parts, actually. So I don't know. But I, I will get a chance to watch that. We'll watch something new, which is narrative. I've never seen that one before. I bought the Blu-ray. Been waiting for it. And uh, this will be a perfect opportunity to watch it. Um, other than that, after... I'm going based off of memory here. Let me, let, let's me let pull up our little handy dandy. Handy dandy. Um... MHQ while I'm talking to you guys about this stuff. So here's the mobile suits. Let's get into our anime section set. Right. I'm getting ahead of myself, but I like to talk about the future. So I already mentioned this. So we got Charge Counterattack. Then we got Unicorn Gundam. Technically, Twilight Axis happens in the time frame of Unicorn, if I remember correctly. That has not been released to the US. I will not be able to review that. Narrative did release. I will be reviewing that one. Gundam Hathaway, I will call it Hathaway's Flash because that's how I remember it from the novel. Um, it's not Biltashi as children. That's the sequel, I think, too. But um, that's not here in the U.S. yet. Makes me question if it's, if it's even out yet. Yeah, see, it says right here, Hathaway's Flash novels. Oh, they are. So this is only the first one. They're going to make the other two. So the second one is probably Biltashi... Biltashi but Tachika's Children, and I don't remember what the third one was called. Um, after these, uh, we are then going to come to Gundam F91, the movie. And I, th I think I, I'm missing it. It said Victory Gundam is 0123. This is 0123 F91. Let me check here. Yeah, UC Century double, uh, double, uh, 0123. And then uh, Mobile Suit Victory Gundam should be after that. So, like, we have a huge time gap between F91 and Narrative, like a 20-year gap plus. And then we get into a 30-year gap because this takes place in 0158. I just recently looked that up not too long ago. 0153. That's that time frame. And then we're going to start doing some big jumps. So after Victory Gundam which would be the last of the UC Century animated-wise. We come into the awful G-Savior almost a hundred years later. We are done with that one, and then we're going to jump into Turn A Gundam. Turn A Gundam doesn't specifically state what time frame it is. It's supposed to incorporate, because these are all in the kind of like in order of release almost. Yeah, this looks like it's all order of release. Yeah, it is order of release. So we have all the UC. This is not in order of... Uh, order of... Wait, did F91 come out first? Uh... 
Does it say what release year? No. Uh, F91, I think, came in... Holy crap, it might have been 1990, actually. Let me see if I can find out. Um... Dang it. I had to go do it the hard way then. Mecha, Gundam, 0090. Oh, no, it came in 91, so it came after... Stardust. I don't know why it's put this. It looks like they're trying to organize this in release, which makes sense. Because when these were released, so like the, obviously 1979, 1980, right? Oh, 1982. Oh, yeah, no, but it aired in 1985, which was 1987, 0087 here. And then this is the following one right after that, 1985, I guess. So, okay, same time frame. 88 is when Charles Counterattack came out, I think. Dang it. Let's see. Charles Counterattack. There we go. 88, yeah. I was right. So Charles Counterattack. So this is all... This is in chronological... So if you guys want to know... Like, well, I don't want to watch Gundam in, in the the time frame that they were released. I want to watch it, like, when it was chronologically released so I can watch the animation progression. This is the best way you can do it right here. At least with the UC Century 2. So, like, you got these ones. You could see the animation change. Flop these two around, but, yeah, change. Victory looks a little bit more there. And then this is in 95, if I'm not mistaken here. 96, 96, sorry. 96, right after New Mobile Report Gundam Wing, because that came out in 95, which before that, 94, G Gundam came out. And then, I think this is 96, 97? Oh God! Come on! Wait! 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 Come on! Come on! Come on! Come on! Uh, you got him after war. Ninety six. So same time frame that um, Eighth MS team came out. Ninety nine G Savior came out, and then wow, that's a oh, no, never mind. Because in that time frame, Z uh, Seed came out. Uh, n after G Savior, ninety nine Turn A came out. Two thousand two or two thousand. Four, right? 2004? 2004, yeah. 2004, 2006, 2008. And then we went for a long dry spell without UC Century. Unicorn came out... I want to say 2007. Let's see if I'm right here. Close, 2009. 2009. So 2009. Got a bunch of seeds that came out during that time frame, though. But what I'm trying to say, though, is that up until this point right here, though, then we had Turn A Gundam. That's where I'm going to start next afterwards. So we got Turn A Gundam with the correct century, which is supposed to incorporate all of this. With the exception of, um, what was it? Come on, brain. My brain's derping right now. With the exception of, uh, I keep saying G in Reconquista. It's Reconquista and G. But um, Turn A Gundam was supposed to incorporate. So it's supposed to take place centuries after our UC century. After Future Sentry, after after Colony, and somehow After War is supposed to happen because After War to me had always been like the what if, uh, an alternative timeline of where Mobile Suit Gundam had taken place with Operation British. But no, Turn uh, Turning Gundam saying Gundam X is in this too, so it's it's taking all the Gundam series, putting into like saying centuries later, this is where it takes place, and then Tomino comes back two decades later. I think this is like. 2000? No, not two. Yeah, a decade later. Almost, like a little bit over a decade later. 2011, I want to say. Oh, for God's sakes. Come on. I didn't say it right here. 2011, right? Come on. Oh, wow. I was wrong. 2014 to 15. I could swear it was before that time frame, but I, I guess I'm wrong here. But then he makes Reconquista G, which then says it incorporates all of this somehow. Take, taking place double the century time frame of that one, but now in a regaled century. So I'm like, okay, cool. But once we once we clear out all of that and get to G and Reconquista, which is another series I'm not looking forward to, I could finally dive into the other um, series. It looks like there's not much for me to dive into afterwards, to be honest. Uh, we can just skip Cosmic Era. <laughs> no. 
I, I don't know. I'm still debating if I wanted to review Seed. If I get enough people that says like, hey, Zaku, review Gundam Seed. We love Gundam Seed. I'll consider it. I'll consider it. God. I hate Seed. I'm sorry. I, I really hate Seed. Just, 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 just to be on the record here, why people wonder why I hate Seed so much. I had, if anyone has ever watched my original reason why that, that was an older version of me that hated it for a very dumb reason, but it, there was also another consistent reason. I don't even remember what I ranted that one time, but the most consistent reason I don't like Seed is Seed bites off too much from the original Gundam and other Gundam series, and Destiny is far, far worse in being the most unoriginal piece of shit I've ever watched. It strips, like, stuff from Gundam Wing, Zeta Gundam... Um, the original Gundam even, it rehashes even a plot that happened in the, in the first seed. So I'm like, God, this is terrible. This is awful. The only thing that's not even redeeming, because like, Seed was also another bad series I didn't like, because as much as some people are like, oh yeah, well, you know, some of the Gundams use stock footage or whatnot. It's not as egregious as seeing the Buster Gundam use the exact same, uh, still shot of him shooting the, his, his, uh, Beam launcher. I don't even know what the type of beam launcher, like beam cannon, is, but it's a beam launcher, beam cannon, or the ale strike doing the exact same pose shooting, or seeing the edgy gun to do the exact same thing. It was pretty bad with still uh, with with um stock footage, right? Sea Destiny is far far worse. There was almost an episode of just stock footage. That's how bad Sea Destiny is. That is. How much garbage it is, and why I do not want to watch Seed. But I get enough people that say, hey, Zaku, please, review uh, Gundam Seed. You're reviewing all the Gundam uh, franchises, or ep series in the franchise. Reviewed Seed. I might consider it, because I still have my Anime Legend DVD, not the Blu-rays. I'm still waiting for right, uh, right stuff to release the Blu-rays for it. I know they're doing the special edition one. Hey, Band, I just released. You know, no, you're not going to get in front of the camera. Don't get in front of the camera. Um, they just released about uh, doing Gundam Seed Eclipse, is what they called that, the new series, I guess. So I don't know when it's going to take place, whatnot. I'm not too familiar with Cosmic Era stuff. I don't like the storyline. I don't like a lot of their characters. I do like the music, though, and I do like some of the mech designs. I, I will be nice enough about this. Two things I do like. Um, other than that, uh, we are going to move on to Gundam 00. After all this, I'm going to move on to 00. 00 I did enjoy. Feels more like Gundam Wing, though, than anything else. With second season following Zeta. Saku, so, why don't you complain about 00 then? At least they approached it more originally than freaking Sea Destiny did, okay? That's all I gotta say. And then we're going to go into Age... I heard a lot of people hate, love hate this one, but I think the worst one I've ever heard people say about Age is that they compare Age to ZZ Gundam, and I will flat out tell you, you are a bald-faced liar if you say that this is like ZZ Gundam. It might be a little bit childish, but so far from ZZ Gundam, Age is watchable. I actually enjoy Age. I can sit down and go like, hey, we're going to watch Gundam Age? Sure, pop that on. I have no problems with that. Some of them says, oh man, I've never seen ZZ Gundam. Can we watch ZZ Gundam? And I'm like, on your own time. Have fun with that garbage. Because I am not watching that again. Unfortunately, I will be watching that again. And then, um, we're not rounding it off, but um, towards the end we'll be watching next. It's going to be Iron Blood Orphans. Uh, that was an interesting one from what I remember watching. We'll get into the Build Fighter series. A lot of that is a lot of fun. Um, I think, just like... Model building itself, how it is, I think this is a really good jump point for some gun. Uh, well, a jump point within its own timeline. I would not say have people jump into this going going into the overall of Gundam. Just because this has more knockbacks and homages to the original Gundam and pays more respect to the other stuff, and it's it's better that way. Um, so you you have more appreciation watching all of this and then coming into this. Not every single one of these, but at least uh, the major ones, at least, right? Bill Fighters and Bill Divers, different universes, but the same con context. And then um, I'm going to conclude everything I have 
with Gundam Evolve. That's why I said, like, there is something that is for UC still within Gundam Evolve. But that doesn't count because it's not really, like, me. So, ow, Nero, stop. I'm going to make you fall. I'm going to let you fall. You want to fall? Ow. Bit me. I'm trying, I'm trying to hold him because he's sitting on my lap and he's going to fall. So it's, like, one of those, like, moments where you're, like, I'm trying to prevent you from falling. And he's like, ah. I'm like, ah. Anyways. I ramble for two hours and 15 minutes now. I've already talked about um, the other two uh, series. Uh, the other two series. I can't wait to jump into Zeta Gundam. I'm very excited for it. It's kind of funny. I want to show you guys this, this stack that I'm looking at right now. Let me just kind of get it organized for myself at least. Just, just a little bit of organization, right? Give you context. Like, man, Zaku, how much have you watched already in about a month's time? This is all I have watched. A month's time. And by looking at this list, that's basically like that much of it. So that can give you an idea of how much more I have and actually how many Blu-rays I actually have of Gundam. So half excited for some of this stuff, half not excited for some of it. I'm going to conclude with this. I think besides Zeta Gundam, which I'm excited to watch right now, um, I'm looking forward to watching G Gundam. I'm looking forward to watching Gundam Wing. Um, I'm even looking forward to Gundam X. I didn't really care for much. I know a lot of people liked it. Um, I didn't care for it, but I w I'm excited to rewatch it again and get a second take on that one too. Um, and I am excited to rewatch Age. Actually, I'm gonna secondhand Double O and Iron Blood Orphans. They were a fun series. Iron Blood just made me mad, but I enjoyed it. It's like, it's like, it made me mad, but I, I liked it. <laughs> and Double O was, it's like the new generation of Gundam Wing with Z with Zeta, with Zeta influences. Also aliens. Aliens. <clears throat> All right. All right, guys. Well, that concludes this episode this live stream episode of nerdy reviews uh please tune in next week again um i i'm gonna try and keep i've been trying to do it at 12 o'clock and then i had to shift it to 12 30 and then you know i actually started streaming at 1 p.m mountain standard time that might give you an idea but i'm honestly trying to keep it at 12 o'clock i'm trying to keep these streams like you know about two hours or less depending on, on what i'm reviewing um I think going forward, looking at all of this, um, most of the material is going to get shorter to review because a lot of what I've reviewed beforehand has been OVAs or movies, so it's been easier for me to watch. The only like full-length series I've had to watch before Zeta Gundam was the original Mobile Suit Gundam, clocking at 42 episodes. Everything else has been about 13 episodes to two, two-and-a-half-hour movies almost. So that that gives you an idea of how much I have to watch, right? A series is about 20 hours long to watch. And I'm trying to cram that in within my work schedule itself. So it's like, I'm waking up early just to watch stuff. And then I go to work. After work, I'm spending some time after, at night watching more. Sorry about that. Uh, watching more episodes. So I'm trying to cram it as much as I can. It's not, not a guarantee. But uh, expect that when I start getting through the actual like full-length series, we're probably going to have these reviews shorter. But... Uh, I'm going to be continuing in the same manner. But yes, definitely, please tune in next Saturday. I will be doing these live stream reviews every Saturday. I'm going to try to keep it at 12 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. If not, well, keep an eye on my Twitter, which is under the exact same name. Um, well, actually, it's under my real name, at Brisson Brown. But um, you can find me at uh, um, Absolute Nerd. Uh, there on my Twitter account, so make sure you follow me on my Twitch account so you can get those updates, uh, get those emails or whenever I go live. But also follow me on my Twitter account because that's when I actually make my announcements of when I'm going live. And um, any, any other fun little things I see or you know want to post about too. Uh, additionally as well, uh, check out, if you if you missed this out and you're, you're catching this on my Twitch videos or whatnot, you can actually find the full length stream, also the cut down versions of each review I did in this case would be for the Th Gundam Thunderbolt and Gundam 0083. You can find their individual reviews on and the full length uh, live stream review I did on my uh, YouTube, which is Absolute Nerd, same name, and you can find it over there too. Uh, but yeah, 
Uh, make sure to stay tuned, keep an eye out. And um, for those of you who are watching in the future, please come on down to the live streams. I would love to chat with you guys while I'm doing my review. I try to break in between the time frames that I, when I'm doing the review to chat with you guys or respond to your comments and, um, you know, incorporate that with the reviews potentially, you know, it's always fun stuff. But yeah, uh, for right now, I'm probably just going to go kick back, relax a little bit. Been a pretty busy week. Other than that, maybe do some cleaning. I don't know. I've, I've been feeling very purgy. I feel like Char Aznable and Char's counterattack. Let the purge begin. <laughs> Okay, I don't remember who quoted that in the movie, but it was in Dynasty Warriors uh, Gundam 2, at least. Man, he said that a lot. <laughs> but anyways, thanks for watching, guys, and until the next live stream, I'll see you next time. Take care. <laughs>